All right, well, would you like to say your name and where you are to start? Yes, my name is Teemu Heino. I live in Finland in this small village about three and 3,500 people called Vihdin Kirkonkila, Southern Finland. Okay, I don't think I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay. And the first question, as you know, is who are you as a person? And that can be your passions, qualities about yourself, your values, whatever you'd like to share. Well, if I start with the obvious one, I'm a father of two sons. They are eight and 13 now. One of them is adopted from China and the other is biological. And of course, I'm a husband to I've known my wife about 30 years now. We met when we were very young. Um, I'm a reptile hobbyist. I have kept snakes and lizards and turtles and tortoises and insects and whatever for quite a long time now. And they have been my kind of constant interest. Gestalt therapy is, of course, something that kind of defines me somehow. The, uh, the way to see the world, it has affect me, affected me a lot since I have known Gestalt. Mm. I am a bit, uh, what would be a good word? goofy i'm not a very organized person and i my memory does not serve me very well i i forget things like yesterday i called my my father called me and as i said to him uh, give me five minutes i'll call you back and i called him today <laughs> which is kind of ironic because he's the one with alzheimer's not me but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I forget things it's uh, an essential part of me but uh, I don't want to go uh, through the effort to remember better. So I just kind of declare that I'm the one who forgets things. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? Values. Um, I'm not a very passionate person, so I don't go out and rant about my values or my points of views, but I think I'm kind of a humanist. When I was in grad, grad is that graduate school? Yes. Uh, we have this, the, um, I'm a psychologist. So, so when we were studying our, the department of psychology uh, was in the first place, part of a humanist uh, faculty. And then we had these pins uh, that said that I'm not a humanist <laughs> and we wanted to be part of a, a behavioral faculty and I thought that that would be much cooler than being a humanist because it's more scientific and, and objective and whatever. But now thinking back, I, I really do not want to be any kind of a part of behavioral sciences. I, <laughs> kind of proud humanist in that way. But anyhow, uh, yeah, I, nowadays I like people more than I'm afraid of them. So, so kind of want to treat people well and, and kind of do my part, support him, whoever comes to my way. Mm -hmm. Some sort of a pacifist too, but, but, not a very passionate pacifist anyway, <laughs> but, but but somehow I. So you don't like run into the middle of a war and. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this may, may be part of a kind of a Finnish culture, which uh, let's not get into too deep there, but but in general, the Second World War was. Um, Big deal here. Finland had just become independent a few decades before, and then 
there are heroic stories how Finland uh, fought against a big giant Russia and, and we were able to maintain our independence. And since then, this kind of a military attitudes or, or defending our country and, and, and related to army and stuff, that those are kind of much valued. And of course, I, I do not mean to disrespect our veterans and so, but, but the, the general attitude towards military machine is kind of a contradictory to me though. So in that sense, I, I find myself being a quiet pacifist. <laughs> um, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what else? Oh, uh, classical music. I like classical music a lot. I have always listened to music quite a lot, but but lately, more classical music. I I think it has to, has something to do with my gestalt therapy experiences because. Earlier, I was really into lyrics, mm -hmm. and nowadays I can. I am not interested in lyrics, but more more on the melodies and their the experience of a certain song, you know. Okay. So, so that's, that that's a bit of you. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's bit a of you. <laughs> yeah. So. What would you say is a particular event or a set of circumstances in your life that either changed you or shaped you in some way? Wow. Mm. In general, I think my life has been quite, let's say, stable. There are no really big events in that sense. Except that I think that um, my applying to gestalt therapy training was, and that journey has been a big change in my life since I was, I was quite anxious child and, and um, young adult as well. And it, it was not kind of a very hard, anxiousness just kind of a, a stable and chewing <laughs> anxiousness and 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 during my training I have got rid of it kind of 100 percent almost and and in that sense I think I think I kind of a new life started from from that point Although I did not really kind of suffer before that either, but but it has. I, I somehow found my freedom. Uh, uh, and that is important to me. Uh, other life events. <laughs> I. From quite quite a young child, I have been a sportsman. I played badminton. I played it much more than it's wise, but um, kind of my from thirteen years old year old until I was I quit when I was I believe twenty three or four or something like that, and that time is. Uh, it gave me a lot, of course, um, lots of self-confidence and it kind of defined who I am. I am the badminton player whenever I was encountered any problems. I, I had these visions of my being on the field and, and then I suddenly kind of uh, find my self-confidence again. It was really nothing else fit my mind <laughs> at that time. And um, like I said, it gave me a lot, but today I think maybe it was not a good thing anyway, because uh, 
being a sportsman takes a lot of pushing yourself behind your limits and I think that's been a part of my my anxiousness at that time and now I've kind of had enough of my pushing pushing myself over limits and 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 so my I have quite contradictory feelings about that that time it was good it was something that really defined me and I would not recommend it to myself if I had could go back in time and tell myself is it a good idea to play bad no it's not do something mm. more comfortable maybe not competitively maybe yeah. playing is not a bad thing but yeah, but it's, then it's boring. So, so <laughs> <laughs> just leave the whole thing. <laughs> That's interesting. I remember Bud Feeder would talk a lot about playing tennis and sometimes playing tennis with his clients or his students. And I think it's really interesting because it is a relational dynamic. It's, it's you know, focusing on what's going back and forth between us. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I have had the opportunity to meet him once he was here in Finland. Uh, I can't remember which year it was, but five, six years ago. It was, uh, yeah, I remember him warmly. It was a special weekend. Mm -hmm. So who would you say uh, was a significant influence on you in your life in some way, from any part of your life, another human being? Well, the obvious answer is my wife, since I have shared my life for so long with her. And, and of course, it, like intellectually thinking, she, she must be the most influential in that sense. And still is, of course. But I think I want to mention my father. He is... Why he's on my mind today is, is because last week he ha he had one, once Alzheimer's diagnosis and then he it was removed and now now it's got back again and 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 last week when I saw him it was he was I can see his kind of his condition is going down he's still living at home and can remembers remembers almost everything but but. But he's getting ill, really. And, and I'm sorry, that's really hard to witness. Thank you. Yeah, it, it is. It's kind of. It's not really my sorrow, but but seeing someone kind of. I don't know if pity is the right word, but 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 um, well, anyway, why he is important because. Um, as I said, I played badminton when I was young, and he was my trainer. And now that my my older son is thirteen, and that was about the same time when I I started practicing full time, and and so when I was young, he he spent a lot of time with me, and. It was, of course, something that I could not appreciate at that time. I kind of thought it was self-evident, but but now now these days, uh, I think it was important to me to have the opportunity to spend so much time mm, with him and and looking at myself now i'm 46 now and, and as i said my son is 13 and i have lately kind of uh, woken up to the fact that i really do behave much like my dad does <laughs> even though i thought i'm i'm so much different but, oh no but my, my kind of way, <laughs> my way to live live is like yeah i go uh, go to work and then I try to stay here at home and be available to my 
my kids and and uh, spending time with them and and stuff like that. So, so so I think I am I'm noticing how how similar I am like him. Although I hope he's pretty clumsy when it comes to emotional things. He he wants to, but he's he's clumsy. I hope I'm smoother than he is, but but otherwise I I I'm really much like he is. Or was he was. And I'm curious also, you mentioned your wife. So how would you say that your relationship with her has influenced you as a person? Um we uh, we met in uh, it's here in Finland it's called secondary high school at the age of 16 and part of my anxiousness has been that uh, I have not kind of been able to find a uh, let's say emotional connection to other people. I, I have, in a way I have been quite social, interested in people, but at the same time, quite afraid of people. So that have kind of stopped me to, to, to really connect. And when I found her, uh, we were friends about four, we four years before, close friends before we started dating. But, um, and when, when uh, we started dating, it was, can I finally found someone uh, and kind of end of uh, that kind of loneliness or not finding my my place in the world and and with her i kind of find my found my place and i guess that's the biggest thing how would you say that over these what did you say 46 years you yes. have come to experience yourself and understand yourself in gender terms or as a man or in your masculinity. That's a tough question. No, it's not tough. I, I haven't really thought about that. Um, what first comes to my mind is I have kind of tried to ignore the whole gender question. I mean, um, I have always thought that I, I get along better with women than, than men. And and obviously, I, I'm not a very masculine man, as you can tell. So, 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 um, I have found myself to be quite feminine. Um, recently, I uh, we were cleaning up my my parents' garage and and found an an very old essay from those high school years. <laughs> in which I, I was uh, writing uh, poor literature teacher <laughs> uh, something ab ab about how it is um, kind of unfair that that men have to be kind of uh, responsible for them and and for themselves and and like tough and not they cannot need other people and, and, and stuff like that. And um, so obviously it's been an issue to me, me years back. So 
uh, I would say that I have been quite insecure when it comes to my being a male or man. I also noticed that somehow I have tried to hide it, like don't be a man. I can't explain it why, but, but, but there is something there too. But nowadays it's uh, kind of not an issue anymore. I think it's because I, I really do, do think that for a man, I'm, I'm really soft and much more caregiving than, than um, an average man in this country would be. But um, in this psychologist, psychotherapist world, those are qualities that are not um, not bad qualities, but more like assets. Yeah, they're like virtues. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the word. Thank you. So, um, and of course, since I guess it has something to do with my my. Yes, I have this family and I have a wife, and so I guess I have been man enough. I guess <laughs> that's the you know, athlete, <laughs> and professional. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, interesting. <laughs> right, and what about your age? How are you at this time in your life, and how are you with the aging process? Because you said you know you you're sort of in this process of. Oh no! I'm I am my father now, and your father yeah, is over yeah. here, and your sons are there. You are the sandwich. Um, let me think. Um, I am mostly, for the most part, I'm amused, amused of my middle ageness. Like I get, <laughs> I have this tendency to get interested in totally useless and silly things like this year it's been uh quite cold winter not not, not too cold but but it's been below uh uh zero and so i uh took this bucket do you know what an ice lantern is you take a a, a bucket of water put it outside let it stay there for 24 hours and then <laughs> take it away and pull out the water and you have a lantern because the, the ice is about this thick so 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 it forms kind of a cup then you put a candle in there and it's beautiful so this year <laughs> i've been phrasing those about uh they melted uh one uh <laughs> one moment but but about 100 and so my really pathetic hobby <laughs> this winter has been putting out ice lanterns and and lighting candles there <laughs> and and it's really pretty <laughs> <laughs> yes it is but it's totally kind of uh useless in that way and and, and right but i, I guess that it's called... <laughs> probably something that you know a man of a certain age can do right you exactly. get to have eccentric hobbies now <laughs> <laughs> exactly and when i think when i was 20 and I would be looking at myself now, I would, oh, come on, <laughs> you can do better than that. So that's part of my middle ageness. I, I do useless, useless stuff and I'm not even ashamed of it. <laughs> well, I don't think we have to be useful all the time. I think we can do things that we enjoy. Yes, you're right, you're right about that. Yeah. Um, my... I laugh at my vision because oh, what's that? In Finnish, it's, it's called age vision. Is that in English too? When you get older, you cannot. Yeah, but, you know, I'm yeah, looking just... at my phone. I can look. I have to look mm -hmm. Yep. So obvious signs of that, which makes me hilarious. I, I, I laugh about that too. Um, but on the kind of 
serious side uh, when I was younger, even in my thirties, I I was really suffering from kind of insecurity. Uh, oftentimes, feeling that I'm not good enough, or or I, I, and also, at least here, young people are really put down in professional life, or or you know, you you hear about your age. You're so young that what do you know? Okay. And I have been happy about that, but I haven't heard that for years anymore. <laughs> and it is related to my age to, to kind of self confidence, too. I think. Of course, there's the therapy and that has affected too, but I think it's related to age too. Although lately I have found that I am also a bit like yesterday. <laughs> I went outside and we have this sauna on, on our yard. I went there and my older son was there too and found that the glass door had shattered. It was in pieces on the ground and uh, kind of quite angry words came out of my mind, uh, mouth. Something that I, I wouldn't have said like five years ago, I, I had more control at that time. So I'm afraid I'm becoming kind of a cranky old man. <laughs> but we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Mm. Also, I'm becoming more impatient, like not, not on other people, but, but this comes down to my, my not being very organized, I just, get frustrated I just want to don't want to spend too much time on details so so in in that sense kind of impatient is that the correct word mm -hmm. not okay yeah. yeah it makes sense yeah hmm. so I'm well, getting then... older but don't feel old yet well that's good I don't think you're <laughs> supposed to feel old in your 40s really? so <laughs> yeah <laughs> So I, this is this is a very personal question that you might not want to answer. Um, actually, several of the people I've interviewed have talked about the specifics of being an adoptive parent. I don't know if there's anything about your experience as a parent or as an adoptive parent that you would like oh. to share. Oh, I would love to. Yeah, just have to think. What could I tell you? Uh, if I start a bit. Uh, from way back, I my first um, job as a psychologist was in child welfare services. I think that's in foster care. It was uh, an orphanage where, uh, if things got wrong at home, violence, uh, alcohol abuse, and stuff like that, children were first brought to this um, orphanage. And then the situation was evaluated and, and we tried to rehabilitate, rehabilitate the, the families. And, and if that succeeded, then the children could go back to their homes. And if not, then they have to, have to uh, find another family or another orphanage for them. Um, so my first five years I was working there. And through that time, I was kind of, that's still very dear word to me. Uh, and I supervised there and, and, and I really, I really kind of, a big part of my heart is in the child welfare services. But also because of those experiences there, I, I kind of thought that I will never want to adopt but our first child was uh, uh, born through um, involuntary childness childlessness can you help me with those words yes infertility yes, thank you yes <laughs> yes thank you thank you so so through those uh, 
uh, processes. We after five years of waiting for him, we finally got him. And and at his birth, uh, his birth was dramatic. And when when later we thought we want to have another child, it, it was kind of obvious that we we cannot go that way anymore. So. I thought at that time that maybe we could, we are very lucky to have one child uh, and that's it. And then I, one summer I went to a family where they had really horrible um, problems. They had, I can't recall, very, very many children. They have lost a couple of them very special needs in there and the, the courageousness of those clients, how they were so strongly going on despite all the all the obstacles they had in their lives. And that experience kind of changed my mind. I thought that okay, if these people can do that, I'm sure we, we can handle one adopted child. And uh, then we decided to, to go for the process. And then uh, the process itself was this kind of, I don't like to too much talk about it because many people have really difficult adopt processes. They are long and they, they suffer. And our was, it can't go smoother than that. Uh, we, uh, the first year, is kind of um, you meet a social worker and, and discuss with her and she evaluates us and and then finally when we when we got to the waiting list we, we were told that uh, uh, we have to wait for one and a half year about but uh, after less than two months we were called and we have a child for you. And this, this is a, uh, a special story because I was working in, as an occupational psychologist at the time. And I was uh, in a meeting with a client uh, uh, who had lost her husband two days ago. And I was trying to support her. And then there's a knock on the door and the receptionist comes and, hey, there's a call to you. Uh, your wife is calling. And that never happens. I was never interrupted there. So I was, okay, something's bad, bad is happening. And then I went there and my wife says, okay, we have uh, 24 four hours to decide if we want this child or not. We had some um, uh, information about him. Okay, and then I was okay. I was totally blown away, of course, really happy and what's going on. And then <laughs> trying to concentrate and get back to the woman who is just lost her husband. And it was really, really uh, a weird situation. Um, That's life and death in the same room at the same time. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. To go a bit further, uh, we find uh, that was the child who we got him. He was uh, the the uh, there was a suspicion that he might have a CP uh, cerebral, cerebral palsy. palsy. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, uh, a mild one, but uh, uh, this was kind of a special needs program. So so there are. In general, they are not healthy. They all have some special needs. And we went there and, and to, to have, a, have a special needs child. And finally, we got here home. And, and it proved that the, what was thought that it was an early reflex that had not, not just gone away. And that was what they thought it was a, uh, that. But um, it was just a really painful ear 
that had not been treated. And, and uh, later on, he, he has proved to be a uh, healthy young boy. So it's a happy story um, about being a parent to him. Um, yeah, I think that is a question, you know, for those who have children in general is, you know, what have you learned about yourself by being a parent? What have your kids taught you? Yeah. Um, I think it has to a lot to do with my professional background because I I really got was in that foster care world and, and think that I the psychology of being a parent to, to of a um, child who has been adopted it was was kind of so familiar to me so <laughs> it's compared to our biological son it, there really is no difference at all everything has gone very easily with him I know it but that's, that's not the case with most adopting families but we have been very lucky and uh, of course I noticed that uh, this story of him being adopted interests many people and he is uh, compared to to let's say Finnish child he is oftentimes more welcome to people are really interesting because you know there's a kind of an exotic tone to him that interests people obviously but but in general it's uh, normal <laughs> I wish I was able to tell you something more about this but no no that's okay I mean I'm like I said, that was a very personal question that you didn't have to explore at all. So I am going back to the, the other question that I do usually ask, which is about power and privilege in your life and how you experience those. I mean, whether you have them, whether you don't have them, your relationship to power and privilege. I am aware that I am very privileged. Living in this country um, where we have uh, peace and the I'm trying to find the correct word. Uh, there is not kind of real poverty in this country. Of course, there are some people who are poor compared to others, but, but in this country, no one stars. Uh, and, and in that way, I am fortunate that I was born to this country, which in, you know, I would say life is easy or easier here in Finland than in many other parts of the world. About myself, I am um, even in, in in this country. I am, of course, very privileged too because I have uh, had the education and and I have a certain um, level of income and which is privilege, of course. Mm. So I'm aware of that. But and do you do choose I... to do anything with it? Anything from that awareness? Um, well, maybe not. <laughs> it's something that, that I have on my mind. And of course, when I'm with my clients who are, who are not um, doing that well, I 
that awareness comes to my mind. And yes, I do some benefit things and uh, stuff like that, but it's not. Maybe I am not doing with it any that much, but yes, I'm totally aware of my, my privilegedness. So you did mention Gestalt before as being a very significant factor in your life. Would you like to say more about where that came from or how your relationship with Gestalt got started? I start with how it got started because this is another example of my goofiness. Uh, when I was in grad school, uh, we had this course uh, of basics of therapy. Uh, and there were, I think, two or three hour lectures. Different therapists from different modalities came there and, and taught about their, their modality, modality. And one day there came this guest out guy who was. Uh, Mm. telling things that I didn't understand at all. <laughs> but he gave an example that at his office, if his client is uh, talking on a very soft or quiet voice, instead of asking her to speak louder, he takes his chair and moves further away and tells I can't hear you. This example <laughs> was, was fascinating to me. I didn't understand why he would do that, but the kind of arrogance of doing that was somehow uh, interesting to me. Then years got on and, and uh, there came time for me to, to apply for or some therapy school. And then I had this on my mind and thought that, okay, let's read about this guest of therapy. I read Walter's book and um, he's the trainer. Mm, didn't understand too much of it either. <laughs> so I wish I could say, yes, I made this comparison of different mod models and read books and, and these are very analytic a choice to choose guest, but it wasn't. I read the book, but already I had decided, okay, this is where I'm going. <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> and so what did you find or what did you understand once you got in there and started working? Um, my, um, there was, uh, at that time, there was fortunately one other thing I was, that was, I kind of understood that at that time I was very, uh, let's say, uh, a stereotypical psychologist, uh, knowing much more things, living in my head, and and you know that that, that kind of an attitude. And I think I would have made a great therapist who spends all his time with his uh, intelligence. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm intelligent, but you know, rational, let's talk through things. And somehow I, I understood that this, the experience part of Gestalt therapy is something that I would benefit from. I knew about experiments and, and I, I, I thought that, okay, I'm courageous enough to do those. And, but somehow I understood that th there is something I need to discover. So that was the other part why, why I thought that Gestalt would be good for me. And turns out that exactly is the, the, I don't know if it's the most important, but very special part of Gestalt therapy. And this is a very special part of Gestalt therapy to me finding the experience, not just emotions, not just smart thoughts, but 
experiencing. And do you have an example of that from your own experience? Like something that you lived that stays with you or that changed you? Mm. Could you ask me the question again? Mm -hmm. Just an example of one of those whole experiences or experiments that <clears throat> you lived yourself. Um, well, in our training, I have a, a few moments uh, on my mind. I'll, there were um, one of them, a, a very special moment for me where, where I was, I can't recall, recall when it was, it was, I have done my training in, in two parts, first three years, and then there were two years in between, and then, then three more years. And in the first three years session, I think it was then, there was a time when I was really anxious and kind of felt that There's no uh, sense in living. I want to die. Of course, that was only part of my, I, I was maybe not really suicidal in that, in that sense, but, but really lost my will to live. And I remember when, uh, uh, one workshop when I was working with this and and ended up on the floor uh, kind of pretending oh no just exploring how it would be to die and I remember that the room going round and round and I was kind of squirming on the floor and and it was so experiential experiential it, it's really hard to put that into words but that was a repeating uh, kind of feeling that I had well once a year twice a year uh, so that point and never had it since it's been a, a 10 over years now, I guess. That could be part of it. And nowadays, like I said, I like classical music and um, kind of the healthy part of this uh, experiential part is that I, I really identify with the music and enjoy it and, and it yeah, well, makes me live. Um, do you feel like you're part, because eight years, I mean, that's a long time to even be training, three years and then the two years and then the other three years. Do you feel like you're part of a community, a Gestalt community? Or what is what is that even like for you? Yeah. Um, I do. Well, if I start with, with our local part first, um, we have, um, there are, um, let's say, five, about five of us who train together. And we meet regularly uh, in our supervision group. Plus, uh, with a couple of other very close colleagues, we have we are starting uh, this new training program of gestalt therapy here. It, it, if we get if enough applicants, it will start in August. And uh, 
uh, that very small group of gestalt therapists is really close to me and in that sense i feel that i am definitely part of that group and and kind of gestalt community in that way but oddly i so far i have not uh, been that much in international conferences and so i took part to your the habitat which was really important to me and then there there have been some some other but i am not very uh, interested uh no <laughs> not um Freudian Stuart. slip. Freudian slip. <laughs> oh no, yes. I'm not very interested in anyone. <laughs> That's okay. Honestly, we're really boring. It's okay. okay. You're not missing anything. <laughs> uh, well, what, what was the word? Uh, experience with mm. the international uh, community. But when you say, "Do I feel if I'm part of it?" I, 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 in a funny way, I feel I am. Although the fact is that I am not. But the the the, uh, um, the experience of those uh, seminars that I have attended is that there are many there are so many really nice and beautiful people out there, and it gives me a kind of great comfort or or feeling of of connection that there are lots of people who kind of share the core values that are important to me and see the world in the same in much much the same way that that I do think that things are in the same things that I find important in life they kind of share the, the same same views and in that sense I do feel that I am kind of connected to people, although the fact is that I am not. But, but yes, I do feel that I am. Maybe that means you are. <laughs> could be. Subjective <laughs> experience. <laughs> it could be, yeah. What would you say some of the challenges you've had around Gestalt have been? Um, you know, besides finding it interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and besides uh, the everyday struggle that uh, am I doing, is this gestalt therapy what I'm doing or am I just on a, some kind of autopilot pretending that this is gestalt don't therapy? Don't ask those questions. But there was a... Um, uh, when I finished my first part of, of uh, my training, then we in, here in Finland, we have to apply. At that time, we had to f apply for, let's say, a certificate to, to use the word, uh, use that title psychotherapist. Uh, unless you have that uh, license, you cannot use that um, title. And when I finished my, my training, I applied for that. and. Uh, I happened to be the first applicant after a law had been changed for uh, for small parts. So they kind of, um, at that time, they decided, although uh, this association had trained guest therapists at that time over 30 years, constant. Uh, but in my case, they, uh, at first, they said that they are not going to give me that license and question the whole uh, training. And the whole process took about two years I, uh, of uncertainty if I am ever going to be a psychotherapist, a licensed one. And, and, and in this country, if you are not licensed, then, then you will not get enough clients these days. So, so. And also during that time, uh, this uncertainty also uh, brought uh, quite 
huge uh, conflicts to our training group. And that whole package before it all cleared was was really nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's I, very difficult. It's like an existential. Am I good enough? Am I real? Exactly. You know, yeah. Does Gestalt believe in itself? Is it legitimate? Exactly. That's a really yeah. difficult process. Yes, yes. And also, I, I had been a psychologist. I really liked that. But then after kind of uh, tasting the world of psychotherapy, I, I was certain I do not want to go back to being a basic psychologist, test children or adults and all that. And I already had decided that if this does not go through, then I'll, I'll quit this job and uh, thought that I will become a teacher of first and two graders, which was before uh, uh, I got to grad school. I was, that the world, it was the third time um, I had to apply for three times before I got into uh, studying psychology. So at that time, I thought maybe I will become a teacher. So that was my plan B. And I think I would have done that. I, I also thought that maybe I should just then study another modality. But I didn't at that time. <laughs> still, you get your I, little, I am not a humanist anything. pin. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I really did not want to do any other modality than this. So. So that was a crucial thing, but finally we got it through and and, and it's okay now. And um, I'm happy because now we are, uh, another law change was made and, and now that we have been able to start the, with our, the University of Uvascular, our new program, so things look, look now a lot clear or something we we hope that Gestalt will get its stable status again it's interesting i'm just imagining a map of the world you know turn the countries green if gestalt is real or <laughs> if gestalt is you know exactly. hippie witchcraft yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's yeah, and, and such a weird process it was really weird because uh, the the feedback we got from that um, bureau that were evaluating the training was really, to me, it looked, it's, it was political too. It, they really thought this is witchcraft uh, and were not, not really, uh, didn't want to find out what gestalt therapy was. It was, I, I think there were lots of prejudice that, that caused the problem, but fortunately it got through and it's okay now. Then so now that Gestalt exists and you exist as a Gestalt psychotherapist in Finland, what are you going to do with that? What are your plans? Where are you going with this? My plan is, I think I'm on the peak of my career now. I I six year six months ago my my previous practice the house it was in was uh, we had to leave from there because it's put down that house and I moved to uh, this village hoping that I get enough clients here and and here in Finland we we have really not enough psychotherapists general so so people are willing to travel even to these small villages to get therapy so the last six months i have really enjoyed to the five minutes walk through a beautiful church garden and cemetery to my practice and i enjoy the peace and not having to push myself anymore, the comfortness of my practice and so. And today I think I, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I hope I can 
find this job in, as interesting as it is to me these days. I hope it will be that way, let's say 30 years. Um, but of course, this um, our trainer, Walter Arnold, he, he kind of retired from, from training uh, a few years ago. And our small group has now, now gone through a big effort to, to start the training again. And, and we are very, really close to be able to do that. And I hope we get that training rolling and, and hope we can uh, do that in the long run to training more guest therapists to, to this country. and. And so you get to way. be a, a grade one Gestalt teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah. And uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe. Mm. Yeah. yeah, maybe it's the other ones who are the great Gestalt teacher. <laughs> I'll hang around. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, we hope we get to train more Gestalt therapists to this country and that way make sure that the uh, Gestalt will continue to live live here because the law is now that uh, you have to be have a certain level of training to have the certificate to train psychotherapists and there are only eight of us who qualify and you cannot use oh. uh, therapists from other countries so oh. uh, right now it looks that if we can do this then this modality will die in our country. And, so you're and like of, you're like the Gestalt therapists in a zoo, like yeah, trying to keep the species alive. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. So, so today it looks like yes, we can do this, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, we the. Uh, uh, People can start applying for our training next month in, in nine days. And, and after that month, we will know how it goes. It's, uh, go that's to in Finland. Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, would you say that there's anything you'd like to add? Or would you like to say anything about where you see Gestalt going? Yeah in general or what your interests are beyond that? I'm not sure if I have much ideas about that. In general, what I've been thinking lately is the common factors of psychotherapy. And, and to me, it would make sense to somehow take those into account in our training, maybe. But like I said before, I, I'm not very um, interested in international stuff, no <laughs> experience with that. So I, I really don't know what's going on here and there. So, so I'm afraid I don't have much ideas about that, where we should go or what should happen. Except I hope Gershaw therapy maintains its diversity. I think it's the most, Im that's important to me that let all the flowers flower. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fair. Okay, well, is there anything about yourself that you'd like to add or any final thoughts? No, I don't think I would like to add about myself. And this, this was fun. I didn't know that talking about myself was, would be this fun. Who knew? <laughs> I've enjoyed it too. I'm very glad to meet you. Yeah, you too. But there's something I want to say, you, say to you. I already wrote about you this, but to me, this project of yours has been really, Humans of Gestalt, has been really important because we live here in isolation. And and to me, it's been really um, important to be able to hear other people's thoughts and seeing all these beautiful 
people and it has kind of expanded a lot my my understanding of Gestalt and, and the whole community. So thank you for doing this. It's it's I have got a lot from it. Now, when you say we live here in isolation, I assume you mean Finland. But now, yeah. I mean the entire world is living like Finland now. Yeah, and that's. It's, why. I think it's it's just the right thing at the right time. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad it's brought connection. So thank you. Thank you. Okay.